your patience with my ignorance. I, these things, all these computers, they're so complicated. I can never figure out how everything works. Fortunately, these people can help me here. So this is a talk that I put together for a couple of uh, classes, a couple of astronomy classes at Oyster Bay High School. I forgot how somebody found me, but I went up and it was, it was a nice experience. So it was sort of a basic light pollution talk. And I've added some other uh, stuff that I didn't read to them. So this is about astronomical light pollution. So this is an example of how light pollution works. And that's pretty much it. The text disappears as the background gets darker. Um, you don't have to answer this because everybody's been under a dark sky. This is we, Big we Bend National anything, Park. Please. Yes, sir. We do not see anything. We see you. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. Jeez. We also yeah, see a um, chimney upside down. Now, that's even more upsetting. I'm sorry. Yeah, he, I neglected right to share on my... Retina. He's right side up on the retina. I, I forgot to share my screen. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. These are complicated things. Yeah. It's so complicated. All right. Now I got to... I'm sorry. I have to deal with, I've got, hang on one sec. That looks very much like the moon. I need your patience. I've got to bail out of this one more time um, because I need to get this to minimalize. No, that's not it. Okay. Google Maps over this. Over the picture. Oh, okay. Oh, that yeah, that's what I want. I want to minimalize it and make sure it's over here. Good. Thank you. One more time. Okay, I don't understand why. Why have I got the green outline? What is that from? Okay, um, so this is an example of astronomical light pollution. As the background gets lighter, we lose the stars. So you don't have to answer this question. Um, this is Big Bend National Park in Texas, uh, right down near the Rio Grande. Um, uh, Stan and I and some other friends were down there and it was just astounding skies. Yeah. I, I got this camera and you like pointed at things and it'll, if you push the button, it'll like probably 15 seconds because um, I didn't bring a tracker with me. So the night sky is beautiful. It's stunning. It's magical. It's mysterious. It makes us ask questions. It shows us where we come from. And it's about our very origins, but you need to be under a really dark sky in order to see this. This is a Stan Honda photograph from the Grand Canyon, I believe. Um, this is from Stan's photo from Joshua Tree National Park. I mean, what a magnificent thing the sky is, but it's rare that we get a chance to be under skies that are dark enough to see this. Um, this is from uh, National Park, Fort Union 
National Monument in New Mexico, another photograph by Stan. Uh, this is my photograph of Orion setting in White Sands National Park in New Mexico, and it was pretty dark there. Um, this, uh, Stan and I went uh, to New Mexico. Um, I get, we went to, yeah, and so this is uh, the very large array, one of the dishes. And I had never seen the zodiacal light before, and it's darker than all get out there. It's it's south of uh, Albuquerque or to Albuquerque by about an hour, and then west. Um, and we were out there, and here was this glow in the sky, and it was the first time that I had seen the zodiacal light. And you need really dark skies to see that. Uh, this was a trip I took to Australia in 1993. That's Uluru, which used to be called Ayers Rock. There's sort of a nice photograph of it. That's, oh, crap. I didn't realize that this thing up on top is showing. I don't know how to make that go away. Anyhow, it's covering up Jupiter, uh, which is rising over Uluru. Um, and, and this is the Southern Cross and part of the Milky Way, which I did not photograph. Um, and this is, Stan, where is this? Death Valley. Um, it's one of the photographs he did. Death Valley. Death Valley, thank you. And you can see the light showing in the distance. Um, and was that Las Vegas? Las Vegas, yes. I think it was Las Vegas. Um, I think this is still Death Valley, I think, and it's Las Vegas. Yeah, Las Vegas lights reflected um, off the clouds. I'm sorry? The Las Vegas lights reflected off the clouds. Right. Crazy. And that's a long way away. I think uh, Death Valley to Las Vegas is 94 miles, and it's still, that's how bright it is. Uh, this is a photograph I did at North South Lake, which is up the Hudson River, I don't know, near Saugerties. And the town in the distance is Tannersville. And I still can't believe it. I think it's five miles away. So you get a nice view of the night sky. Um, but, you know, the light from Tannersville is, is taking away a lot of it. Uh, this is Stellafane in Vermont a few years ago. And, and that has light from uh, towns south of Stellafane. Um, still, it's great observing, but as you get close to the horizon, that's washed out by light pollution. Um, this is a favorite. One of the first things I did with my Nikon D300. Um, this is John's telescope at Stellafane with somebody looking through it, and that's Jupiter. And again, you can see some... Um, some light on the horizon. And this is Kitt Peak. And this is astounding because that's uh, uh, that's Tucson. Um, and I for Kitt Peak to Tucson is 45 miles. No, so, Ken, Ken, you know, Ken, that's Phoenix. I'm sorry? A lot of that is Phoenix, I think. Um, well, it's I drove from Tucson to Kitt Peak. So that's looking back toward Tucson um, from, from Kitt Peak. I'm looking east, I think. Um, anyhow, that's, that's, that's almost Tucson. shocking, but the telescopes there can still operate because they're looking up or whatever. And this is Custer Institute, and that used to have really dark skies um, and not so much anymore, which is disappointing. I used to tell people, you could go there and see the Milky Way on a good night. And I, in over two or three years, I'd been out there four or five times and each time I couldn't see the Milky Way. And I thought, all right, it was faint. And I thought, oh, it must just be a bad night. And then finally, Steve Bellavia said, no, um, it's, it's deteriorated. I'm not looking in the direction of the Milky Way, but, um, and then this is here at Vanderbilt. Um, you can see the stars in uh, Cygnus, um, but that the 
tree is sort of to the west or northwest. Um, so it's it's taking its toll. Um, this is uh, South Hole Town Beach on the North Fork of Long Island, looking toward Clinton, Connecticut. And uh, that light goes way up in the sky. And I've forgotten what the distance is to Clinton. It's probably 25 miles or something. So, oh. yeah, like I said, it's uh, 25 miles. <laughs> Sorry. I put it on there so I would know what it was and then fail to read it. Thank you for all you observant. Yeah, right, <laughs> round trip. So um, what is light pollution? Light pollution is the presence of unwanted, inappropriate, or excessive artificial lighting. In a descriptive sense, the term light pollution refers to the effects of any poorly implemented lighting. It's a side effect of industrial civilization. Its sources include street lights, building exterior and interior lighting, advertising, outdoor area lighting, such as shopping centers, offices, factories, stadiums, auto dealerships, gas stations, convenience stores, billboards, driving ranges, and, and one of the worst is just parking lots. Light pollution is most severe in highly industrialized, densely populated areas of North America, Europe, and Asia, and in major cities in the Middle East, North America, and Africa, like Tehran and Cairo. It has been estimated that 83% of the world's people live under light polluted skies, 83%. And that includes all of us. And I believe that we as humans have a primal connection to dark skies. It is in our DNA. I believe this is a quote from Stan Honda. I believe that our connection to the universe lies in a, this diminishing resource. Throughout time, we have looked to the heavens to navigate, create myths and stories, and dream about distant worlds. Preservation of this view of the night sky is essential to our heritage and to even to our survival as a species. A major side effect of urbanization, light pollution is blamed for compromising health, disrupting ecosystems, and spoiling aesthetic environments. Awareness of the deleterious effects of light pollution began in the second half of the 19th century, but our efforts to address the effects did not begin until the 1950s, in the 1980s, a global dark sky movement emerged with the founding of the International Dark Sky Association. What the hell is that? That is, I was driving down this street in Seacliff. It's about a quarter of a mile from my house at 1130 at night after leaving our meeting. And it's like, what is that? So I came back in the morning and uh, they're LEDs. Oh, great. So they're not burning much electricity. But this just made me ape. I mean, come on. What, what is the point? There's not a light on in the house. Some rich guy owns the house. I happen to know his mother, but I, wouldn't, I don't dare say, call him up and start, a, you know, start by calling him names. I mean, what is that? That makes no sense at all. Um, Notice how on the right-hand side, there's sort of a tunnel of darkness and there's a street light, which adequately illuminates everything. This in particular just made me crazed. Um, this is the house that's kitty corner to our property. Um, you know, it's, it's 100 feet away from our house. Fortunately, I guess they were just having a party. So every once in a while that will be on, um, but most nights it's not. I'm thankful of that. I think these people know that I'm president of the Astronomical Society of Long Island and they're taunting me. This is the house across the street. They have 
bright lights on the front door and I were friends and I asked him if he could reduce the wattage and they did once and now it's back up. And the crazy one is that blue white one to the left, that's on somebody's deck on the next street behind and it's pointing right at the bedroom, our front bedroom in the house. It's not pointing down. Like, what is the point of that? Um, and then this, to add insult to injury, is at the uh, northwest corner of our property. It's about 20 feet, 30 feet from our house. Like, you can't win. Um, and then this is crazy. This is Northern Boulevard, just west of 107. An awful lot of the light that ends up in the sky, probably more than three quarters of it, is not inevitable. If we can get light to be more effectively used for the purpose that it's intended, give people enough light to see by and to accomplish whatever task or security they want, but not five times as much or 10 times as much, we could make huge progress. I'm not making numbers up. The magnitude of the misuse of light is so large that if you address it, you can readily make substantial improvements in the sky, even without changing the fundamental way society and people relate tonight. It is safe to say that virtually everywhere the problem continues to get worse. One way to measure the extent of light pollution is to ask, can people see the Milky Way? That is the threshold where the sky is in the transition of turning from something stunning and inspirational to something mundane. In Europe and the United States, between half and two thirds of the people live where they cannot see the Milky Way. Two thirds, that's a large fraction. More and more people are losing the night and only because they're moving to the cities, but because the amount of light used per person is growing. We're deciding it's more important to light up more things and more brightly. An obvious example is what happened to service stations in recent years. A lot of people would certainly notice that they've increased their lighting levels by startling amounts. And actually the ratio is five or 10 times as much as they used to use 20 years ago. Where it used to be considered acceptable to have a parking lot lit to 20 times full moonlight, it's now common to go 10 times that, 200 times the full moonlight. We're becoming increasingly isolated from the night, and as we become isolated from the night, it becomes strange and fearsome to us. There's always been an undercurrent of human fear of the dark. But people who are afraid of the dark now aren't thinking about bears and tigers generally because they're living in cities or areas where a large populations have been completely, where large predators have been completely eliminated. Even in the remote areas of the United States, most predators have been eliminated, wolves, for instance. What we substitute is the fear of crime and the fear of each other. That's underlying a lot of this increased lighting and it's all reflective of growing out of touch with night. We don't have a realistic evaluation of what's dangerous. Crime at night is not actually much greater than it used to be and in some places it's less than it used to be, but we feel that it's worse. When you ask a lighting designer why they use so much light, if it's really necessary, they oftentimes say, this is what our customers ask for. It makes them feel secure, they say. Our business is to respond to our customers' needs. And if they say they need light, we give them light. We need to educate people to much more realistic conclusions about the risks at night and how lighting can help 
to split apart the difference between feeling secure and actually being safe. You can double or triple or increase by 10 times the light and people might feel safer, but they are probably not safer. They may actually be less safe than if there was no fixed lighting at all. And there's a cost appropriated with this approach, a cost measured not in the money for paying the electric bills, not just in money for paying the electric bills. There are resources consumed, air pollution produced, light pollution, the loss of the night skies, and their inspiration, increasing isolation of all of us from the natural world at night. And it feeds on itself. People aren't going to ask to preserve the stars if they've never seen them. The fewer people who see them, the fewer people who would ask the question about whether all of this lighting is necessary. Once you identify a real safety issue that you can address with lighting, it can be done with lighting that has much less impact on the night sky. We usually just throw up light that is glaring, wasteful, oftentimes too much, lighting that may actually compromise safety. Take glare. If a light shines into your eyes, it makes a thing less visible. It always does. By definition, glare is blinding light. So we put up a light to help us see something on the ground or behind the bush or the other side of the street, but it also shines into your eyes, which takes away visibility. With glary lighting, we actually create darkness where me where we have been may have seen fine with the added light and also if there's light shining in your eyes we're not going to see the pedestrian walking on the side of the road in the dark um this is uh, from the web it's uh i think it's a european thing i mean that's crazy giant lights i i like this because of the fog these uh, in the distance seem a little bit more shielded than these do just shining up into the sky. Like yeah, right, it's <laughs> pointing straight up. I mean, this is crazy how much light is in this gas station. And this wasn't the one that I photographed. Um, this came from the web and I added text. How about my inconsiderate neighbor? No one else in the neighborhood of 12 homes leaves lights on all night long, even after being talked about, does this out of spite, real winter. So the guy's got some giant light on the back of his house, lighting up his whole backyard truck's um, garage, and the light is coming out and lining up the, this guy's home in his backyard. And if there's no lighting ordinance, there's nothing he can do about it. I don't know where that is, but I think it's in an area of not much light, and that's got to be maddening. So... Uh, for the students, I thought I would point out that the moon can add light pollution and make it less interesting for us to go observing on, on nights when the moon is, you know, first quarter or later. There's also unintended consequences of uh, too much light. This is a photograph that Stan did of the tribute to light for the World Trade Center. And it's it's an amazing thing, and it's a moving thing, which you know we can see from Long Island, uh, a memorial <clears throat> to those who perished in the World Trade Center attacks. However, uh, 160,000 birds a year um, die. What happens is insects fly; they're attracted to the light. The birds follow the insects into the light. The light blinds them, completely disorients them, and then they fly into buildings or just drop straight down. So it's it's good that we have this memorial, but some things have unintended consequences. So what are we losing? Um, you all know this, I'll go through it quickly, but I just wanted to show the students, um, you know, we're we're losing the ability to see faint galaxies and open star clusters, globular clusters, gaseous nebulae, M8 and M20, uh, M51, again, faint galaxies, and we miss seeing the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and we certainly miss things like supernova remnants. 
Um, this is Hale Bopp from Custer. I don't remember the year that Hale Bopp came by, 97. And this is the best I could do. I did get the ion tail and the dust tail, um, but I should have been somewhere else. I didn't know any better to go further east. I mean, I got the comet, but it could have been more better. Um, so how bad is it? It's bad. Um, the illuminated parts of the world. And um, I bring the students home to New York. Yeah, I mean, that's how bad it is. So, uh, so what is the fix? Lighting should only be on when needed. I'll go tell that to the guy who lit up his street. He'll appreciate that. Only light the area that needs it. Be no brighter than necessary. Minimize blue light emissions. And for those of you of a certain age, you'll find you're blinded by the new LEDs on cars. And be fully shielded, which means pointing downward. So unshielded, the light goes in all directions. Partially, you're keeping some light out of the sky. Fully shielded, no light goes into the sky other than what might be reflected from the ground. Here's a pretty example of it, same thing, shielded. And to beat a dead horse, I was talking to high school students, so I thought I needed to emphasize this, but this is a nice example so you can see what happens with the light. So these are unacceptable and discouraged uh, lighting fixtures. They're unshielded floodlights, the one on the left, um, just shines straight out. So it goes straight out and up and down. Um, you can see they're all badly designed and they're usually mounted on buildings. Um, unshielded bollards for people walking goes out in all directions. The unshielded street light is what's in front of my house and the unshielded barn light is also similar. So these are the good fixtures, uh, you know, flat lens, full cutoff, the light can only shine down. The, um, those, that wall mount fixture that's triangular shaped is terrific compared to, um, for instance, I'll show you an example. The one uh, in the upper right-hand corner, I have an example of what that looks like in a building near me. Um, and instead it could be the triangular one in the bottom. Um, this is a shopping center near me. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose is because if I wanted to break into that building, the fronts of the buildings are all in shadow. Um, so if somebody comes by, they're not going to see me in the shadows. I would think they'd want to light up the building, but who knows? Okay. Okay. Both, both, yeah, both, both like create the glare. And Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I may knock off this a this a closed Dunkin' Donuts that maybe has a full cash register. I may hit that on the way home. So um, this is the building. It's owned by a bank. And you can see in the upper left, I showed you that fixture in the picture. It's just shining straight out, down, out into the road. And there's two of them over the doorway. Like if the first one over the doorway isn't bright enough, they added another one. And this was crazy because I was thinking about this talk. And I'm driving home from a meeting and I was stopping, you know, every three minutes in my neighborhood to get yet another example. Uh, this is Glen Head. And they have those wonderful looking old fashioned features like who could not be in favor of them? Well, me, um, you know, it's it's quaint and all that. But man, they're wasting light. Um, and once again, the one that's at the northwest corner of our property. Um, you all know about the Bortle scale. So I was trying to tell the students about, you know, where we are and we're in uh, Bortle seven or, or five for the most part. So is this the end? Is this what's going to happen? Or will this be the end? Will something be done? to make the skies better for us. And now this, 
the uh, telescopes at Lowell Observatory captured this image of galaxies, um, but the Starlink satellites pass through the image. And if you want to see something, oh, that isn't it. Uh, okay. I can't read that. SpaceX something or other would increase light pollution. So this is uh, Cerro Tololo Observatory. And that's like a really expensive, fancy array with all those sensors and just wiped out by the Starlink satellites. Uh, here's a guy who did a nice job trying to photograph Neowise and Fumpf. And then this is interesting. I guess this was shortly after a Neowise launch. Uh, that's a concrete base of an old energy plant in Hungary, but what that's a, actually an astounding photograph with the, all those streaks going through. Um, I've forgotten where I got this book, but I got a lot of information from it. It's an absolutely fascinating book about the night and darkness, and I highly recommend it, especially for us as amateur astronomers. It's a terrific book, The End of Night, my copy is completely underlined. There's so much good stuff in it. Um, and then this is a, a collection of essays called Let, Let There Be Light. And it was edited by Paul Bogard, who wrote, Paul Go Bogard wrote this one. And this is other people writing about uh, the sky at night. And uh, there are some essays that are not quite as interesting, but there's a whole broad spectrum of of essays about the night. Um, so I highly recommended that. And I told the kids to go observing and you only need binoculars and you should buy that. So that's the end of my talk. Ken. Yes, sir. On your drive here tonight, did, did you drive through Huntington Village? Yeah. Did you notice the sign in front of St. Patrick's Church? Yeah. No. They had this Terrible. huge LED billboard. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and they used black text on a white background. So it's oh white. man! And in, are you serious? Yeah. It's it, 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 it's especially bad in the rain because it just lights your whole windshield up and you can't see anything yeah. past your windshield. Wow. Yeah. And no, it's just all of that. There, there was no consideration given. They they updated that with a static painted sign yeah. originally. And then, you know, they put that in. Yeah. You're right, in white background. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take a look on the way home because I've. It's so bright that it's, that it's hard to read the sign. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, credit where credit is due. Um, the second part of the readings that I did. Um, was from the book, uh, the second book on the night sky. Uh, and it was written by Christian Lugenbuehl, uh, who was a professional astronomer, um, I think at Anderson Mesa, I, I, but he'd also been at the US Naval Observatory. Um, and he's retired now and he's in uh, Flagstaff. Uh, Stan sees him a lot when he goes out there for the Flagstaff star party. So. I'm going to look this up. This I copied this from the book, um, not Let There Be Night, but the other one, and it's called What the Solution Would Look Like. And I'm hoping I can find the text uh, on the web and then post the text for everybody to read. I didn't read everything, even though it seemed like I did, because um, I know it's boring to hear me read, but uh, it's a really good piece that talks about all the um all the issues uh, Ken, you remember that uh, we had measurements. you know what hang on let me do the thing here we bought this man we're going to use it <laughs> if i can figure out how to set it up this looks like an electronic toothbrush it is <laughs> okay but it but it also has a microphone in it thanks Oops. john <laughs> Buddy. sorry no you're not uh Ken, you remember the uh, the movie that came out a few years back, A City Dark, or the uh, the City Dark, which oh covered, right, Sam is in that movie, yeah, yeah, uh, which covered all of that information, which by the way also covered 
a lot of uh, data as to how it affects biological uh, biological life forms. Humans in particular are absorbing this light energy at night when they're not supposed to be. And there's a lot of data that backs up that it's a primary reason why people experience trouble sleeping, depression, which leads to other things like cancer and so forth over you know, a period of time. And it's, it's really, really true. If uh, everybody remembers Hurricane Sandy when it came through here, we were without power for eight days in my neighborhood, okay? I slept better during <laughs> that time than I have ever slept in my entire life. Right. So there's a lot of data which shows your brain is operating on levels that it shouldn't be, that we don't have a conscious level of control over. And, and one of the issues is melatonin, and our bodies produce melatonin at night but if it's not night or dark, they're not producing it, and the melatonin helps us to sleep. We were, we're born to be half in the daylight and, and half at night. Ken? So, uh, Ken? Um, yes, Tony. Uh, Hang on. I'm sorry. Okay. Wait, uh, let me give it to Tony, and then I'll come back. One of the things that really disturbs me, if you put aside light pollution, they're spending billions of dollars on electricity, on lights, which uses electricity, which increase costs, which increases our, pollu our pollution level. Because they are there, we are using 10 times more light than necessary, and we're not using it efficiently. So it really disturbs me that our government doesn't see that, and our power companies don't see that. Because if you think about on Long Island alone, how many lights are left on unnecessarily at, at what power level, and you add that all up, it's got to be a huge amount of money and huge amount of pollution. You know, so that's what I don't understand. Unless we start a legislation, talk about that. That's when I start realizing that, well, we got to regulate our lights better. And they're not. And I don't understand it. Even they're going with LED lighting I'm doing right now. Huntington's being lit up like a Christmas tree, even by my house, which wasn't bad. Now they got all bright LED lights and they still got to use power. Now, yes. And, and where, where my business is, I, I, I'm an industrial, uh, industrial area. And a lot of the buildings in my block, um, the buildings have all these lights illuminating the whole parking lot and everything. My building's different. I had my electricity and put in uh, floodlights, uh, LED lights that go on if you go into the building. If you go on my property, the lights go on immediately. So no one's going to try to rob something if the lights come on immediately because they don't know if somebody turned it on or they're automatic. So that's the only my comment I'm going to say. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I didn't read to spare you was um, that Christian Lugenbuehl says that when communities are installing light fixtures, they're, they're fixed on how much do the fixtures cost. And they're looking to save money, make it simple, make it cheap. And he pointed out that you put the light fixtures up and they're good probably for 25 years. Uh, the one outside my house has got to be older than 50 years but so the fixtures are good for 25 years but he points out the fixtures are a one-time cost and the rest of the cost over those 25 or 50 years is the electricity that you use to light them so if they're throwing light up in the sky sideways and down if you had um, shielded fixtures you could probably use half the wattage or less and that electric cost is 90%. If you look at the whole project, the, the fixtures and the use of electricity, the fixtures end up being 10%. The electricity ends up being 75%. That argument won't, won't carry much water now because the LEDs um, are much less expensive. They're putting LED lights into Seacliff. And I wanna go talk to the city manager um, he said, we've got some nice fixtures. They spread the light out. And I want to go and say, wait a minute, why do you want to spread it out? The whole point is to keep it down. 
But here's the other thing that's really astounding. They apparently are going to use some RF system in the wires. They can fine tune any light in the village. If somebody calls up and says, you know, this is shining in my window and I'll be first in line. Uh, if it's not shielded, they can turn your lights down. What I'm curious about is I was out with my um, SQL meter taking readings under street lights and doing some photographs. And I wanna see when the new ones come in, do they think, well, it's the, they're cheaper, so let's jack it up and use twice the light. Anyhow, I wanna to talk to him about that, but it's interesting that they'll be able to fine tune any light in the village if you have a complaint. Oh, okay, uh, Joel. Yeah, um, bear with me for a few minutes because I have a few comments to make. First of all, I mean, for those who remember seeing the movie City Dark, um, they spoke about melatonin. Uh, the pineal gland is a small pea-sized gland at the base of the brain that makes melatonin. And that's commonly been referred to as the third eye it's because it has connections to our eyes and it detects when it's dark and that's when melatonin is made. The key thing about melatonin is it's got anti-carcinogenic anti properties. That is, it fights cancer. So people who are living under light polluted skies are at greater risk of developing various cancers. It's been proven in nurses that work the night shift in hospitals have a much greater incidence of breast cancer than uh, nurses that don't. That's, uh, that's, that's the number one thing I, I wanted to say. Number two, uh, in 1990, uh, we built our house uh, on Long Island. That's in Roslyn Heights. We're about, I would say six miles from the Nassau Queens border. And that's you know, very close to a lot of lights. But in 1990, I was able to see the Milky Way from my driveway. And now I could barely see second magnitude stars. Um, now, the third thing I want to say, I mean, as amateur astronomers, we've all been out in dark skies, you know, just to illustrate what we're missing. But how many of us have been in truly, truly dark skies? I, because of my eclipse uh, trips, I've been in three places that was so dark. First of all, the Australian outback is well known for that. And even standing in a parking lot that had some lights on, the Magellanic clouds were clearly visible like beacons. Two, in Zambia, the stars were reflecting off of the Zambezia River. Three, but the, the most places that, that, I, I, that impressed me was in the uh, Altiplano in Bolivia. It was about 12,500 feet up. We had camped out there. And I went out at night, you know, from the tent and took a look up after my light, my eyes got dark adapted. And I was able to see naked eye Barnard's loop. How many people could say they could have seen it? And, and to confirm it, I woke up Craig Small and said, Craig, you gotta come out and take a look at this. And he confirmed that he was able to see Barnard's loop naked eye. That is a truly, truly dark sky. Now we all talk about how we lost uh, the, the, the skies at Custer used to be so dark, or people go out to Cherry Springs and, and it's so dark and it was darker then. But even compared to these sites, you know, is what the, the, the sky really, really looks like. And if people actually were, had a chance to see this, we might not have the light pollution problems that we have. Joel, where, where do you think the light came from that's impinged on your neighborhood? Everywhere. Well, first of all, I had a whole thing um, uh, about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I, my property is right behind the parking lot of a temple and they expanded the parking lot and they had to get permission from all the neighbors, although technically I found out they didn't, but they invited us and they showed us a model of the parking lot, which came all the way to the edge of my property, which actually was far away. And they showed all the lights that we're going to put in the parking lot. They were gonna be on 30 foot tall um, towers, you know, what do you wanna call them? Jeez. Totally unshielded every few feet. And I said, uh-uh, I'm not giving my permission for this at all. And they actually sat down with me and said, well, what would you do? He says, well, first of all, all first of all, 
you're going to lower the height of these poles to no more than 10 to 12 feet, number one. Number two, every light is gonna be shielded. And I explained to him what that meant. Number three, no lights ought to be pointed above the horizontal. No lights are supposed to be, ought to be faced in the direction of my property. And the number of lights you're going to have has to be reduced. And, and we actually came to a legal agreement. My lawyer grew, drew up an agreement, they signed it, and they did it. Of course, it's a waste now because the whole area is just totally lit up because uh, everybody moved out from the city, many of them to my neighborhood, and with them, they brought the idea that they need all these insecurity lights uh. everywhere. And you can't see, you can't see stars. You can't see anything from any more of my property. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I, I, I got a similar experience uh, when I first uh, doing after photography in Valley Stream. Though the old members remember, you know, what I used to do uh, using, a, uh, using a film. Uh, in Valley Stream, uh, it was two blocks away from where my, where my parents used to live, uh, two blocks away from Queens, 10 minutes away from Kennedy Airport. And I used to do a lot of outdoor photography, and there were stars visible at nighttime. That back in the early 80s, from the 1980s, something when I first doing it. Then um, a, a year ago, uh, no, before my mother passed away and the house was sold, I was in the backyard one more time when the sky was clear and the sky was much worse. Neighborhoods light, the back lights, the backyard lights, or most of them all on. And I keep keeping saying to myself, how I did this doing after photography 40 years ago. And I can't even do it, you know, if I have to do it all over again today in that backyard, that would be impossible. Uh, how much difference it is was when I first started. Thank you, Frank. Um, anyone else? Sam. Keep in mind a couple of things. Uh, the power companies, uh, whether it's LIPA or any of their predecessors or the ones where I live, they are in the business of earning profit by selling electric power. As a result, it is never in their interest for you or any town or any housing development to consume less electricity. For example, when I was back on Long Island, uh, there was a, may still be there, I don't know, a car wash on Sunrise Highway and Spiegelhagen Street in Lindenhurst. And one night, that whole area was lit up to a blinding level. And I had lived uh, five or six houses down the block, north of Sunrise Highway. And I went over there and I asked the fellow who was the manager at a car wash, can you please tip that down? It's actually, I can make shadows on my house from that light and I'm halfway down the block. And he said, I don't have to do nothing. They give me the light for $7 a month, as long as I want it on. So that means that at that point, and this was uh, about 20, uh, 2002, 2003, when that light was installed, the guy had to pay $7 a month and his entire business was flooded in light. So to him, operating a car wash, even if it was closed at night, it didn't matter. He's getting it almost for free. Now, where I live here, the same uh, mechanism works, but in the other direction. They changed all of the 660 watt high pressure peach colored sodium vapor lights in my housing development. They changed them for LED fixtures, right? It fits in the same silly unshielded uh, luminaires as they call them. And it, you know, it's, it's actually much brighter. Now, how does, the, how does this benefit the power company? Real easy. They, say they charge not by the quantity of power you use. They are billing per month per lamp. As a result, the more lights they put in, the more they get to bill. It doesn't even matter if every one of them was disconnected. The money rolls in. And what they did here is they said, and by the way, for the same thing, because we bill you per lamp and not for the wattage, we are increasing and giving you double density. And you can read the newspaper standing in the middle of the street in front yeah. of my house. You can read the classifieds without a flashlight. 
That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, I'm going to stop the recording so that it doesn't get yeah. too um, long. Sam, uh, one more thing. If you remember yes. uh, when you were on Long Island, remember Southern State Parkway? They have a horizontal light. Yes, and that's what killed the Milky Way from the house I was living in in Merrick in a single yeah. night. We went from Milky Way to nothing. Yeah, um, they have um, they have all wooden uh, lamp that that the light was pointing down. Then they um, I don't know yeah. they they, um, they changed to this. Yeah, then uh, the light was shining on a horizontal, and oh my God, it's a lot of glaring, especially when it's raining. It's a lot of glaring around the windshield. You can't even see where you're going because you were blinded by the light. The AMA has any number of papers which can be cited that show that there is a direct correlation between bad lighting and so-called GIB or glare-induced blindness in seniors. In fact, a couple of times I've heard talks by Dr. Mario Mata, who is a cardiologist, but also is very active, not only at Stellafane, but also in the IDA. And Mata has distributed lists of all of the articles and all the AMA journals and so on and so forth about glare-induced blindness in seniors. Uh, and even if you're not a senior, if you have schmutz on the inside of the windshield or you know, where you can't see the lane markings because of the reflection, I, I don't have to tell you what it's like. No one's going to do anything. It, they made a great big deal when it was discovered that cigarette smoking had a connection with lung cancer. What I cannot understand is why Article after article after article talks about glare-induced blindness and no one's having any action as a result of it. Wow. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you everyone for all your um, 